continuing with code. Let us first divide cognition into rational analysis and sensory perception, which Descartes considered valueless. Now reason gives us concepts which are true but tautological. Sensation gives us images. Content is phenomenal. Whatever greets our sense. Here we go with some phenomenal content. Okay, before, when we finished up, he had been closing up the sources of error. Right up there. So we're going to be doing this stuff here. We come to this Latin phrase, and we're going to have to skip it. I don't know, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to look up every single word individually and stitch it together, because I can't find anyone anywhere on the internet that tackles the phrase. Um, now, then, he's closing up the sources of error before. <coughs> a, a metaphor occurred to me to, to understand what he's actually doing. What he says he's doing and what he's actually doing. Right? What he says he's doing is, is tying off all the areas, like shutting down these um, dead ends. There's a bunch of dead end streets and he's just cordoning them off so people stop wasting their time going down and turning around and coming back. He's closing off dead-end streets, he says. What he's actually doing is more like what my dad taught me as pollution, or par pardon me, um, population control for kittens. Because on a farm you can go from 10 kittens to uh, 50 to 100 in a matter of a year or two. And so farmers are aware that you've sometimes got to get rid of an unwanted litter of kittens. And my dad told me when I was a kid that the best way to do this is an old gunny sack or a burlap sack of some kind. And you close off, you put the cats in and you close off the exit and then you throw it in the river. And that's about what Immanuel Kant seems to be doing with his philosophy here getting everybody confused, getting them to turn in circles and um, close their eyes, pretend they don't have eyes, put your arms out and stretch your arms out forward and just walk around in a circle groping. And once he gets everybody to do that, he's going to close the door and drop the whole situation in the river. I'm pretty sure that's his uh, raison d'etre. Alright, so continuing from where we were, this important change in the field of the sciences. Remember, he's going to change the sciences in a better way, right? So that they're going to be objective now and take account of the real world, or take account of the real reality, anyway. Take account of the things that he points out and says are real, because as he's pointing out, the real world doesn't really exist, or we can never know anything about the real world. We have to take account of his um, little gyrations in his little book here, rather than the real world. Uh, once these important changes in the field of the sciences are put into place, this loss of its fancied possessions to which speculative reason must submit does not prove in any way detrimental to the general interests of humanity. Now, Remember earlier he said he's not going to give examples every step of the way because that's just for commoners. He's going to do a much more sophisticated thing here. So every once in a while we're going to want examples, but he's already preempted that. If we ask for examples, we are commoners. Now, maybe we should look at an example of someone not giving an example. But we will because he's going to go on about schools. So if you want me to give you an example of people needing examples and not giving examples, well, first of all, this is a species of that, isn't, isn't it? Just in itself. But secondly, hold on just a second, because he's going to make some pretty strong claims about education, and we're going to ask him who he's talking to and what he's talking about. And the point really is that he's talking to everybody and anybody. So Immanuel Kant is some sort of blank slate, and you can come to him with your previous suppositions and just write on to him all of the stuff that you believe and then use it and roll with it. So he doesn't necessarily have a system so much as a method. And anybody can use his method for their delusional preconceived notions.
Not rational people. This method's no good for rational people. But for everybody else, it's great. All right. Excuse me, please, while I... <clears throat> the advantages which the world has derived from the teachings of pure reason are not at all impaired. So he's not going to hurt... He's not going to hurt the general interests of humanity. The advantages which the world has derived from the teachings of pure reason are not at all impaired. What is pure reason? Nonsense, right? So there are advantages the world has derived from the teachings of nonsense. And those advantages are going to be fine. We're, going to, we're not going to endanger them. We're going to make some important changes in the field of the sciences. Speculative reason must submit, but pure reason will not be damaged or impaired, neither will humanity. It's just speculative reason. The sciences will undergo some changes, and speculative reason must submit um, its fancied possessions, but humanity and the teachings of pure reason will go on unscathed. The loss, remember the loss of the fancied positions of speculative reason, the loss falls in its whole extent on the monopoly of the schools, but does not in the slightest degree touch the interests of mankind. So, his system of speculative, re of, of pure reason, is, is not going to affect mankind in any way, but it will negate uh, the schools having total and absolute power over certain things. I appeal to the most obstinate dogmatist whether proof of the continued existence of the soul after death, derived from the simplicity of its substance, has ever been able to pass beyond the limits of the schools, to penetrate the public mind, or to exercise the slightest influence on its convictions. All right, so I appeal to the most obstinate dogmatist whether the proof of the continued existence of the soul after death has ever been able to pass beyond the limits of the schools, to penetrate the public mind, or to exercise the slightest influence on the public mind's convictions. Not only the soul after death is of that nature, but derived from the simplicity, oh, pardon me, but the freedom of the will in opposition to the general mechanism of nature, drawn from the subtle but impotent distinction of subjective and objective practical necessity. That should be in parentheses, right, to set it aside. Um, from here, drawn to necessity should be in parentheses to, to take it out because this is such a big convoluted sentence. Okay, so the continued existence of the soul after death, the freedom of the will, or the existence of God. The immortality of the soul, the freedom of the will, or the existence of God. Okay, that's what's in blue. Oh, let's put that in there too. The uh, soul after death. Okay. Or the existence of God. Okay. So now we've got a list of three things there. And he's appealing to the most obstinate dogmatist whether these three things of the soul of God uh, or of the free will have ever been able to pass beyond the limits of the schools to penetrate the public mind or exercise the slightest influence on its convictions. Now, it looks like he's just saying that the public mind has independent convictions, right? And the schools teach one thing, 
but the public goes on its way and does the other thing. I'm pretty sure that's his complaint there. He's got a lot of gobbledygook going on. The contingency of the changeable and the necessity of the prime mover has ever been able to pass beyond the limits of the school. See? What all was blah, blah, blah. Now, ends realism, he says in here. Let's see. Drawn from the subtle but impotent distinction of subjective and objective practical necessity or of the existence of God deduced from the conception of an ens realismum. The ens realismum, let us look at that. That is in the Oxford reference here, and oxfordreference.com, and it means the most real being, a term for God, reflecting the belief that reality, like goodness, comes in degrees, and there must be a limiting, ultimately real entity. Now, without getting off into physics too much, it is just the case that we are in a universe where um, matter is rolling down a hill, energy is rolling down a hill, it is cooling off, it was thick, heavy, and nearby, and it is expanding and being thin, cold, and spread out. Now, we can party while that's happening. After it has happened, there will be no more parties, there will be no energy, and nobody will be able to move around, and matter will disintegrate. Um, it's kind of like you got on a bike, you go to the top of a, you know, the hill, and when you jump off, or when you start riding your bike down, or you start skiing down, you're hang, hang gliding, whatever it is, you party until you get to the bottom. The Big Bang was the beginning, it was when we jumped off. What exactly the nature of the Big Bang is, you know, is bizarre, but we are simply in a state of energy expanding and cooling, and while that happens, we can party. You know, when you have a cup of coffee, and that coffee cools down, that energy is now lost. It, it's used up. The universe is a battery, and every time you use up energy, it, it dissipates into lost heat, and that information is gone forever gone. And uh, that is the phenomenon of the expansion cooling of the universe. You are using up the universe. Every time something cools down, you have used up some of the universe. And uh, that is not an infinite process, I don't think. Maybe it is. Maybe we'll discover that it is an infinite regenerative process. But it seems like, you know, for the, through the laws of thermodynamics, that it's not. It seems like there's a finite amount of energy and it's it was at the top of a hill and it's moving down the hill and we get to party until it gets to the bottom of the hill. Okay, like I said, not spending too much time on that. So he's complaining that the public has a different set of convictions than what the, the schools are trying to impart. It must be admitted that this has not been the case, that owing to the unfitness of the common understanding for such subtle speculations, it can never be expected to take place. This um, We can never move the public. The public is always going to have its own convictions. On the contrary, it is plain that the hope of a future life arises from the feeling which exists in the breast of every man, that the temporal is inadequate to meet and satisfy the demands of his nature. We can definitely raise our hand and say, Immanuel Kant, excuse me, isn't that a rather brazen assumption there? He not only makes a really brazen assumption, he assumes it for every single human being, past, present, and future, that they believe the temporal is inadequate to meet and satisfy the demands of his nature. In other words, every single human being, bar none, past, present, and future, we can know this much about them, that they want and believe there to be something beyond the real world, some other more ends realism. Okay? Now... If Immanuel Kant is, I think, his project supposedly, right, supposedly his project is to undo the incorrect assumptions and to get us on a sure footing. 
Now, should he be making really, really broad, wild assumptions like that if he's going to get us on a sure footing? He shouldn't be doing too much of it, but he, he's, he's sure doing it, isn't he? That's a really, really, really big assumption. Now, I might go to him and I might say, well, Immanuel Kant, listen, the temporal is all we have. He would say, well, you're not a man. Because all men believe that the temporal is inadequate. Right? So he's just going to dismiss me. Uh, he's just going to dismiss me, isn't he? If I go to him and say this, he'll say, well, you're just an idiot. So, in a like manner, it cannot be doubted that the clear exhibition of duties in opposition to all the claims of inclination give rise to the consciousness of freedom. So it cannot be doubted, it, in a like manner, it cannot be doubted. So we have to believe that um, a good example of duty in opposition to all the claims of inclination, that's what we might would want to do, Inclin what you're inclined to do. The duty is, is in a, a opposition to what you're inclined to do. Um, it's true that a clear example of this gives rise to the consciousness of freedom. Alright, so in his view, we are able to realize that we are free because duty points us in one direction and our inclinations point us in another direction. That's what gives rise to the idea of freedom. Okay, Now, he hasn't you know, built a solid case for it, and this is merely in the introduction. But, those of you who want to know where Immanuel Kant stands on morality, we can see it right here in this sentence fragment. Okay? His stance on morality is that we are inclined in one direction, and duty puts us in the opposite direction of our inclinations. And when we realize that that is the, the conundrum that we face as human beings, that our duties pull us one way and our inclinations pull us the other way, then we are able to conceive of freedom. We are able to come, become conscious of the fact that we have freedom. Now, that's not my position. That's Immanuel Kant's position on morality. So, morality, duty, you know, what we, what we should do, is in opposition to what we are inclined to do. Okay? Now, that, aside from that being horrific and extremely strange and bizarre, right, because, so, therefore, what we should do, why should we do that? Because it's good for us? No. I mean, maybe, maybe that's what he's saying, but if, if that's the case, then what we're inclined to do is what's bad for us. And that would be a whole theory, wouldn't it? But that would be called original sin. What we're inclined to do is bad for us. So he certainly is taking a, just a common cliched view from altruists and religious people about ethics and duty. Very common, very cliched view that we should do the opposite of what we want to do. The exhibition of duties in opposition to all the claims of inclination. Okay, it's a very strong case he's making, isn't it? But those of you, I mean, there's I, these people have come and made comments on my Kant videos that Immanuel Kant uh, supports, you know, free moral action or something like that. You know, uh, utter utter garbage, utter garbage. Immanuel Kant says, oh oh, and, and then the Immanuel Kant says that it's okay to benefit from a moral action. No, he doesn't. He says the nature of moral action is in opposition to benefit. Benefiting is in opposition to moral action. Okay, right there. It's right there, okay? Now, he hasn't made his case strongly, so don't blame me. That's just an assertion in his introduction, but there it is. Okay, in a like manner, it cannot be doubted that the clear exhibition of duties in opposition to all the claims of inclination give rise to the consciousness of freedom. 
So we're able to think about freedom for this reason. And that the glorious order, beauty, and providential care everywhere displayed in nature give rise to the belief in a wise and great author of the universe. Okay, so why do we believe there's a God? Because we see order in the universe. And we see beauty and providential care everywhere displayed in nature. Now, I don't know what providential care would mean. Does that mean that he rode his horse down a, a sunny, farmy lane one day, and there were apples growing on trees, and the air smelled sweet, and he was comfortable, and everything was going good on that day? You know, what does he mean by order, beauty, and providential care? Just that sometimes some things go well? What would he say about this glorious order, beauty, and providential care uh, to some Russian serf who was born in 1918 and came of age in 1938, was a, a grown man and was thrown into World War II by Stalin and maybe made it out the other side. Where is glorious order, beauty, and providential care for some poor Soviet soldier who at the age of 27 comes home from Germany back to Russia, having won and beat, beat fascism, and then he gets arrested and put in the gulag because he's seen the world outside the borders of Russia. And then he dies in the gulag, a wretched, wretched death, having avoided starvation and disease by what means his whole life and avoiding terrible violence and explosions and gunshots and bombs and he makes it at the end to a gulag where he's punished for having fought for his country and dies like a wretched rat at the hands of some guard where is the glorious order beauty and providential care everywhere displayed in nature that shows us a wise and great author of the universe in that system Immanuel Kant now of course I'm describing the Soviet Union which is a an exemplification of Immanuel Kant's philosophy. It's Immanuel Kant's philosophy in practice. So, he's able to crow on about how great the world is living in the Renaissance. So, ladies and gentlemen, take this lesson. Those of you who think that we've got progress today, we've got science, now we just need to seize the science, seize the progress, take it from the rich, and use it to benefit mankind. Okay? You would be much, much better off living in 1776, surrounded by whooping cough, diphtheria, cholera, no knowledge of germ theory, no knowledge of modern medicine at all, no knowledge of even penicillin, no knowledge even of anesthesia. You would be a starry-eyed, um, just living a wonderful life in that reality compared to somebody living in, let's say, Soviet Russia or Nazi Germany, where they had electricity, they had penicillin, they had automobiles. They had radio. Where do you want to live? 1776 or uh, 1940? Germany, 1940. Germany, 1776. The Enlightenment with no science was a better time than uh, 140 years, 170 years later, with all that science but no freedom. Okay? So he's going on about this glorious order, beauty, and providential care, which he himself then puts a very vicious end to with his philosophy. Such is the genesis of these general convictions of mankind, so far as they depend on rational grounds, and this public property not only remains undisturbed, but is even raised to greater importance by the doctrine that the schools have no right to arrogate to themselves a more profound insight into a matter of general human concernment than that to which the great mass of men, ever held by us in the highest estimation, can without difficulty attain, 
and that the schools should, therefore, confine themselves to the elaboration of these universally comprehensible and, from a moral point of view, amply satisfactory proofs. Okay. The school should confine themselves to these satisfactory proofs. Okay. Such is the generous such is the genesis of these general convictions of mankind. Um, they are satisfactory proofs. He calls them here the general convictions of mankind. He calls them here amply satisfactory proofs. Okay? The schools should confine themselves to the elaboration of these. Okay? That's what the schools should be doing. He's griping about the schools here. The change, therefore, affects only the arrogant pretensions of the schools, which would gladly retain in their own exclusive possession the key to the truths which they impart to the public. Now, we've been going on about the schools. The loss of monopoly fall. The, this loss falls in the, its whole extent on the monopoly of the schools. And I promised you earlier we would do something about this. Now, he's gone all the way to the very end, and he says that humanity has some common beliefs that the schools should be imparting, and that should be their business. Now, I don't know what quod mecum nescit solus volt scire uh, videri is. I don't know what that is. I'd have to, I'll have to look it up, and I, I couldn't find it. What I wanted was some explanation of that sentence somewhere, but I'm going to have to dissect the whole sentence. So I'll get to that. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe it's not worth my time. But, what I want to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, is what group of people who are disconcerted about the schools would not like what Kant says here? Because Kant doesn't give any um, concretizations, any concretizations. He doesn't concretize anything, does he? Or he does concretize it. He doesn't concretize it. That's an interesting word. And to concretize means to not give examples. So, here's what he's doing when he's griping about the schools here. He's saying, is anybody unhappy about the schools? Now, of course, everybody's unhappy about the schools, right? The labor unions are unhappy because they aren't getting paid enough to run the schools. They want uh, teacher pay to double, right? And they want fewer students in every class. They want, uh, therefore, we'd have to, if we cut the number of students in classes in half, we'd have to double the number of teachers. And they would like that. They want more teachers. They want more teachers paying dues. And they want more teachers number-wise. They want more teachers. So the teachers' unions are unhappy about the schools and what the schools are doing. What about conservatives? Yeah, they're pretty unhappy because the schools have drag queens teaching kindergarten classes. So they're pretty unhappy. So who's, who's not unhappy about the school? Is there anybody that's just sitting there going, oh, school's doing pretty good? Yeah, about 3% of the population, the ones that aren't paying any attention at all and aren't affected by the schools, are happy with the schools. Now, he isn't saying exactly what the schools are doing wrong because he's not giving examples, is he? He's just talking in floating abstractions of, oh, arrogate to themselves profound insight, elaboration of comprehensible... Uh, moral stuff. He doesn't give any real examples of real policies of real schools of really what they're doing on the real world in the real on the ground. Okay, so everything he's saying, it doesn't matter where you're at, you can get on board with him. Is anybody mad about the schools? Yes, right. Conservatives are mad. Liberals are mad. Everybody wants the schools to change in some way, and he says, how should the schools change? They should do what the people want. All right? Who is not on his side here? Now, this whole paragraph we've just gone over, everything in blue there is just floating nonsense. It's gobbledygook. There are no examples. We don't know what he's talking about. We don't know what policies he wants to stop, and we don't know what policies he wants to put in. We only know that everybody but everybody is on his side. Right? He is trying to get the schools to start spreading general convictions of mankind instead of arrogating to themselves more profound insights about this general human concernment. 
he says, forget these stupid, arrogant bastards down at the schools. We're talking about the great mass of men ever held by us in the highest estimation. The schools should therefore confine themselves to elaborating these uh, great things that the mass of men believe in. So this is just rabble-rousing. This is rabble-rousing everybody. This is incitement to, to riot. Who's he inciting? Everybody. He says, let's get those bastard monopoly schools. Right? Now you're halfway tempted to go along with him and say he's right. The schools are garbage. Right? But what, what does he propose? He proposes the conviction, the general convictions of mankind be taught with their amply satisfactory proofs. So he's just a rabble rouser, a violent rabble rouser. Quod micum nescit solus volt scire videri. Don't know what it means. Okay, at the same time, it does not deprive the speculative philosopher of his just title to be the sole depositor of a science which benefits the public without its knowledge. Wink, wink, hint, hint. So, he's saying, uh, in that paragraph above, he's saying, let's take care of the public, let's preserve the public, let's do this for the public, everything's for the public, screw the schools, the only, <coughs> the only thing that's legitimate is the public interest. <coughs> By the way, the philosophers can set up some systems the public doesn't necessarily need to know about. So up here is rabble-rousing, the public this, the public that, only the public, only the public, only the public. By the way, philosophers can set up systems that the public doesn't even know about. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Okay, at the same time, it does not deprive the speculative philosopher of his just title to be the sole depositor of a science which benefits the public without its knowledge. Now, is that or is that not what he's mad at the schools for doing? For trying to sneak in some principles to the public which the public don't write, don't don't like, and they keep on not taking account of, and they keep ignoring, right? They keep trying to impart these principles to the public, but it just has its own beliefs, its own general convictions. So he's mad at the schools for doing that, and then he says, by the way, the speculative uh, philosopher is has is, is justice is given to the speculative philosopher when we say that he is the only person who can deposit science for the benefit of mankind, which mankind doesn't even need to know about. So, he says the schools are doing a bunch of nonsense. They should get back to doing general satisfactory proofs. And while that's going on, he's going to tell us some stuff. That's what that sentence is. Okay, let's wreck the schools because they're trying to impart their own system to mankind. Now then, let me tell you about my system that I've got for mankind, which will benefit the public without the public even knowing. Screw the schools and their big old system. Here's my system to benefit the public. I mean, of course, the critique of pure reason. Now, what is his move with the Critique of Pure Reason? What exactly is he up to? It's not a comic book. He does not want absolutely everybody to read it. It's not even Anthem or The Fountainhead. It isn't even Atlas Shrugged. Atlas Shrugged is a massive cornucopia of ideas which can be read and understood by very common people, by people who do not have, you know, it may not be understood in the deepest philosophical levels, but they can get something out of it. Okay? He's not doing that. That is not what the critique of pure reason is for. As he says himself right here, 
the critique of pure reason, can never become popular, and indeed has no occasion to be so. He does not want it to be popular. For fine-spun arguments in favor of useful truths. So apparently he's characterizing the critique of pure reason as fine-spun arguments in favor of useful truths. Now, is he or is he not a platonic pragmatist? He's platonic in the sense that he believes that you can just make arguments very carefully, fine-tuned arguments in your head without checking reality. So he's a platonic floating rationalist. And useful truths is the definition of pragmatism. So he is a platonic rationalistic pragmatist. Or he says he is. He's trying to be. He wants to be. He wants you to think that he is. Okay, now, so he's got the, the critique of pure reason. Can't become popular. There's no reason for it to be. It's very fine, well done. It's useful and practical. And it, ha it makes a, as little impression on the public mind as the equally subtle objections brought against these truths. So it makes very little impression on the public mind. Just as little impression as somebody who were to um, attack it. Now, that seems like a, a whistling in the graveyard, whistling in the dark, saying, la-di-da, um, by the way, don't attack my writings because uh, the public doesn't really take account of my writings, these fine-spun arguments my very practical and fine-spun arguments, the, the, the public doesn't really take account of it. They're not too worried about it. And um, if you attack me, the public's not going to pay any attention anyway. Nobody cares. There's very little impression on the public mind of these fine-spun, useful truths. And there's very little impression on the public mind of subtle objections brought against these truths. So the public's just not paying attention. On the other hand, since both inevitably force themselves on every man who rises to the height of speculation, it becomes the manifest duty of the schools to enter upon a thorough investigation of the rights of speculative reason, and thus to prevent the scandal which metaphysical controversies are sure sooner or later to cause even to the masses. Now, up here he says, it doesn't have any effect on the masses, but now he says that if the schools don't get this in con under control, at some point, the masses even are going to be affected by this. We have to get the definitions of pure and speculative reason set down and understood by the schools and taught correctly, or else the masses are going to come to a disaster. Now, he is contradicting himself a bit when he says earlier up here that the schools go on teaching their principles, and they go on teaching them, and they go on teaching them, and yet um, the public just does, uh, doesn't exercise the slightest influence on the public's convictions. Now, he says that the schools had better get their shit in order, otherwise there's going to be massive problems for the public, for the masses. So, you might say, Immanuel Kant, will you please make up your mind? The problem is that he hasn't given an example. And when you're not dealing with an example, you, you can very easily toggle back and forth between two given ideas. Once you give an example, you say, well, here's what I'm talking about. And then everything starts to clarify and crystallize. But until that, it's imagine, imagine closing your eyes and putting a blindfold on, and turning out the lights, and spinning yourself in ten circles, um, and then trying to decide which direction you're facing. Right? You're not going to have any idea. And it doesn't matter how many times you turn around until you touch something in the real world or take that blindfold off, 
Until you get some more information, you're not going to know which way you're facing. And that's what Immanuel Kant's doing. He's got education up there, and he says, he, and now he's not connecting it to reality. He's simply saying education is um, st stuck in a scandal. The real people are going about their real business in the real world in one way, and the teachers are teaching this hoity-toity floating nonsense in the other way, and it's not connected to the real people. Then in the next paragraph he says, this stuff that they're teaching in the schools is dangerous and it's going to wreck the people. It's going to cause problems for the masses. Didn't you just get done saying that they aren't affecting the masses? The masses are going on about their, their way. So this is what the point I was making, that he's talking to everybody. Doesn't matter why you're mad about the schools. He's talking to you. Doesn't matter why you're mad about the culture. He's talking to you. It doesn't matter what changes you want to make to the schools. Do you want to change them so they're more religious and dogmatic? Yes, 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 says Kant. Do you want to change them so they're less religious and less dogmatic? Yes, 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 says Kant. What do you want to do? Yes, says Kant. You see, he's not a philosopher. He's a blank slate that people can write their own garbage on. He's a bunch of floating nonsense. He doesn't disagree with anybody, except rational people who want evidence in the real world. As long as you don't want evidence in the real world, you agree with Immanuel Kant. It doesn't matter what you're trying to do. You may be going one direction or the other direction. Everybody's got blindfolds on and nobody's looking at reality anyway, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so he is a mess. And he's worried about the masses, and we've got to get the schools in order, or else damage is going to be caused to the masses. It is only by criticism of that metaphysician, by criticism, it is only by criticism that metaphysicians, and as such theologians too, can, say, can be saved from these controversies. So we've got, by criticism, he means just platonic floating argument. Just academia arguing with academia about floating nonsense. That's what criticism means. Uh, so it's only through that that um, these can be saved from these controversies and from the consequent perversion of their doctrines. So this is a very dire situation. There will be controversies and perversions of their doctrines unless we use Kant's system of pure reason to dissect it all. Criticism alone can strike a blow at the root of materialism, fatalism, atheism, free thinking, fanaticism, and superstition, which are universally injurious. Wow, materialism's injurious, fatalism's injurious, atheism's injurious, free thinking is injurious, fanaticism's injurious, superstition's injurious quite a list there, as well as of idealism and skepticism, which are dangerous to the schools, but can, spare, can scarcely pass over to the public. Just wanted to make sure I was recording. God, I've been going a long time. That'd be a disaster. Okay can scarcely pass over to the public. If, government, if governments think proper to interfere with the affairs of the learned, it would be more consistent with a wise regard for the interests of science, as well as for those of society, to favor a criticism of this kind, by which alone the labors of reason can be established in a firm basis than to support the ridiculous despotism of the schools, which raise a loud cry of danger to the public over the destruction of cobwebs, of which the public has never taken any notice, and the loss of which, therefore, it can never feel. The schools are protecting cobwebs, he says. So, we've got to sweep away this garbage that the schools are teaching and teach something useful for, for the interests of science and society. 
It would be more consistent with the wise regard for the interests of science and society that we sweep away these cobwebs because uh, the public doesn't take any notice of what's being taught in the schools and they can never feel the loss of it. So we can change the schools without anybody feeling any loss or noticing any problems at all. What should we change about the schools, Immanuel Kant? And his answer is, yes, yes we should. No, how, how should we change the schools, Immanuel Kant? Yes, yes, we should change the schools. Okay, that's his only answer. He hasn't concretized or given us anything. It's going to be his book, right? The Critique of Pure Reason. I mean, of course, The Critique of Pure Reason. That's what it's going to be. But what exactly it's going to be about, we don't know. It's just going to be better for mankind. He hasn't concretized exactly what he doesn't like about the schools, and he hasn't concretized what he's going to change and what's going to be different. That's why so many people on the left like him, because as long as you aren't into evidence, as long as you aren't into definitions, as long as you don't want to talk about reality, Immanuel Kant's a lot of fun, and you can really just go along with him and go, yes, yes, great, great, yes, yes. So, there we are. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you appreciate what I do, if you enjoy what I do, please go to Patreon, give me 5 or $10 a month, and make this something that I can take seriously, spend my time on, and not feel guilty when I'm making these videos for you guys. Mr. Cropper out.